More than 5 billion people found themselves without access to justice before the COVID pandemic hit. Millions more are now struggling. They may have health problems, have lost their health insurance and coverage. They may have lost their jobs, been forced to migrate, or been thrown out on the streets due to financial problems. They have rights on paper, but no ways of realizing them. Conflict affected countries in fragile situations are specifically vulnerable, but I think we are all now experiencing fragility. The pandemic is also threatening meager progress for women's rights and access to justice. And lately we have seen millions of people demonstrating worldwide for equal access to justice, independently of race, gender, class, or sexual orientation. They want equal access to justice and people-centered justice. We are here to talk about what to do about it. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone, wherever you are. I have the great pleasure on behalf of G7 Plus and Pathfinders to wish you welcome to this Fragility Forum to address how to achieve justice for all. And we have some of the best possible speakers to address this. Minister Sigrid Karg, Minister for Foreign Trade and Development Cooperation in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Netherlands. We have Minister Musa Efteen, Minister of Justice and Attorney General of Liberia. And we have Mr. Ferid Belhag, World Bank Group Vice President for Middle East and North Africa. Now, we know that the pandemic has exposed and intensified existing injustices and deepened inequality. We also know that it has increased the risk of violence and conflict in every region. The World Bank Pathways for Peace report warns that a breakdown of justice systems and the rule of law can inflame grievances and thereby create incentives for violent behavior and mobilize for conflict. Someone once said to me that violence is simply unmet justice demands and grievances. Resolving and preventing people's justice problems, as well as improving their justice journey, has a positive multiplier effect for both peace and sustainable development. And the need for people-centered justice has never been greater in the midst of a pandemic and with plans for recovery. The experience of the G7 countries, G7 plus countries, shows that justice is indispensable for conflict prevention and sustaining peace. People and businesses need a system to resolve the justice problems and enforce their rights in a way that is accessible, efficient and fair. The G7 plus Joint Action Plan for Access to Justice for All in Conflict Affected Countries calls upon all actors to integrate justice considerations into their peace, security and development strategies and recommends concrete steps to make this a reality. The Justice for All report also outlines the critical role that people sent to justice can play in protecting societies from insecurity and conflict. And it is exactly that approach which mobilized also many of the Nobel Peace Laureates through our times of whom more than 20% had legal and justice background. They created peace with that approach. And we need more, li more champions like that. We have such ch uh, justice champions here. And I would like to give each speaker an opportunity to present introductory remarks. Following those, I will have follow-up questions with the speakers, and then hopefully a little bit of discussion at the end. So first, I'm going to hand it over to Minister Karg, Minister for Foreign Trade and Development Cooperation in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Netherlands, with long background in global affairs. She has served as minister since 2017. Prior to that, she was UN Under Secretary General and Special Coordinator for Lebanon. Between 2013 and 15, she led as UN Under Secretary General the mission to eliminate chemical weapons in Syria. And she has also served uh, in several positions abroad with IOM, UNRWA, UNICEF and the UN, 
working in the Middle East, Jerusalem, Amman, London, Geneva, and New York. I'm sure I've overlooked some now. She has, for this purpose that we're going to discuss here, a very long and engaged background. She has been a fierce defender of justice and deserves considerable praise and thanks for her leadership in the task force on justice, as well as for her strong personal commitment to justice and fairness, both internationally and in the Netherlands. And with those words, I hand the screen over to you, Minister Kauke. Hmm. Thank you very much, Liv. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, I think that's more praise than I deserve. And I see very great colleagues uh, such as Farid and others on the screen. And I think we're I think all of us who are committed to peace, security and stability and human rights, I think are in this endeavor together now more than ever as it's needed. So you've, you've already, I think, outlined very uh, eloquently and comprehensively the issues that we sort of aim to tackle today. So I'll try not to repeat some of the same uh, issues in my, my opening, but we're, uh, let me repeat some of the so-called knowns. Uh, I'm also looking, of course, at the World Bank, knowing that we'll be faced with the, uh, the economic depression that is to be, to be the deepest uh, that we've known uh, in the last 80 years. Now, any crisis, but particularly this crisis, risks deepening pre-existing vulnerabilities. It deepens certainly inequalities, be it in developed but even more so in developed, developing countries. And of course, as a corollary, it also increases pressure on already fragile human rights situations. And as we know from prior crises, the most vulnerable are not only falling behind, they risk being lost out of sight, out of view, um, short of rights, so to speak. Um, before the pandemic, and I believe you've, you've referenced that live, 253 million people were already living in extreme conditions of injustice and one and a half billion people could not obtain justice just in respect with, I would say, their daily legal problems, be it property rights, inheritance rights, uh, land disputes, or smaller uh, matters, a settlement of bills, indebtedness, etc. And of course, uh, as you've highlighted, economic hardship, systems uh, oppressive in nature, but structural inequality are, of course, a very explosive, toxic mix in today's environment where most countries are struggling to deal with the impact of COVID-19 and of course the issues of law, access to law and, and the articulation of rights risks also being sidelined as the world deals with the health consequences of COVID-19. But this is an area of work that we should actually prioritize even more so and not sideline. Because if you look at some of the interviews that have been conducted by the Hague Institute for Innovation of Law, recently 270 justice leaders in the Middle East, North, North Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa region were interviewed and they expressed one singular fear above everything else that the current justice crisis leads to new pockets or sources of violence. And of course, those who risk mo being hit mostly are women and girls, but not only but also healthcare professionals, as well as all economic actors, particularly in the informal sector. And I know we've read a lot of reports about the impact of the lockdowns on people working in the informal economy. And those, of course, are mostly the most vulnerable in any society and country. And again, it is billions of women uh, that have been impacted uh, mostly by the stay-at-home orders, where, of course, violence, domestic violence, is also a further uh, outcome um, and an indicator of increased risk. Now, what do we need to do in order to keep up the quest for justice? Of course, we need to, uh, we need to advocate fairness. People need to be protected against repression. That goes without saying. One doesn't need a COVID-19 crisis to obviously state that. But we need to look at resource uh, redistribution. So the, the sharing of scarce resources needs to be pursued in a more equitable manner through systems. But with that, of course, dispute settlement at a local community level or household level needs to be addressed and needs to be settled in a very different way. For that, we need a system, both formal and informal. But we know that, of course, most resources that are spent, certainly when it comes to overseas development assistance, investment in the justice sector, formal and informal one, is very small and has declined. Actually, whilst the needs are going up, 
there's a decline of availability of resources and underinvestment is not only politically a bad sign but it also reaps of course it it you 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 reap the consequences uh, of what you've sown and if you if we plant very little we can expect an even weaker justice system and without justice there is no chance to build a proper inclusive social contract we speak a lot of the viability of a social contract the importance of a social contract but if we do not invest in it with actually fairly limited means a lot can be done we cannot expect to see change um, and I think it's important that we use this panel, of course, also to discuss that if we think justice, and I know we do, is an essential service, it is part of building trust in governance, governance systems, and of course, government, be it local or national level. Uh, and I think it's very important we need to articulate what types of investments we see and we seek for justice to be real, to be tangible and to be accessible. There are a few uh, areas, and then I'll, I will conclude. We need to prioritize, of course, access to justice as an integral part of our response and recovery strategies. And I would say particularly now in the context of COVID-19, we can use the SDGs um, as we've always done uh, in order to guide us, but also help set uh, the benchmarks. And uh, if we look at the impact of COVID-19 now on individual lives and households, in the areas of employment, debt and bankruptcy, we need to really target access to justice uh, in order to help mitigate the impact of le uh, legal disputes, but also try to have an adaptive legal environment. And I think there's an opportunity here in this particular crisis. The Netherlands, of course, has been a long supporter of SDG 16.3. We, we value greatly people-centered access to all, uh, and I know you've seen a lot of the elements, of course, in the conference we held last year, the Hague Declaration on Access to Justice that we've hosted with the G7 and the Justice Ministers. And of course, it's resulted in the Joint Action Plan. But we now need to action. I mean, the, the difficulty with declarations and plans is we, we applaud ourselves on the outcome itself, the result, but we need to see progress. So we're working to get the data on access to justice. We are trying to document certainly innovative and low-cost effective approaches, and particularly, I believe, um, low-cost approaches that, that will help create access to a greater number of people that have been uh, structurally and systematically left behind, uh, and that we need to help overcome the structural injustices. So this conversation, I believe, is a, is a renewed call to action. We will continue to invest and we're looking to our partners such as the World Bank, of course, and others to really help us raise the bar in terms of the platform that we build and in terms of the investments and maybe the, the, the opportunity that we have together to scale up. Um, and maybe we can use some of the future regional meetings also of the World Bank to really bring new uh, representatives of the justice community to these types of the meetings to ensure that uh, content and finance is matched in order to arrive at the change we want to see. Thank you very, very much. Thank you so much, Minister Krug. Uh, very well spoken. And now I'm going to hand it over to another justice champion, Minister Frank Musadin, the Minister of Justice and the Attorney General of the Republic of Liberia. He's also served as the Honorary Consul General of the Russian Federation in Liberia and as a partner in the Dean and Associates Law Office. I also know that Minister Dean has very much seen on the ground the effects of COVID, so we are uh, looking very much forward to hearing what you can tell us. Please, the screen is yours. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, fellow distinguished colleagues of the World Bank Fragility Forum, Her Excellency Secret Gun, Minister for Foreign Trade and Development Cooperation of the Netherlands, Mr. Farid Gauzia, 
past president, Middle East and North Africa World Bank Group. Our moderator, Liv Torres, director of Finals for Peaceful, Just and Inclusive Societies. I thank you very much. No doubt everyone will agree that COVID-19 has changed the world and it has presented a situation where urgent action and answers are needed. I'm therefore delighted to be a part of this virtual panel discussion on the topic, investing in justice for all to prevent violence and conflict organized by our friends, the Pathfinders for Peace, for peaceful, just and inclusive societies. In collaboration with the G7 Plus Secretariat in the New York University Center on International Cooperation. As justice actors of our respective countries and institutions, particularly those of us of the G7 Plus group, continued efforts aimed at exploring better and improved opportunities for the enhancement of access to justice in society in a people's center way is key to sustaining peace and harmony. It's key to national recovery as well as economic growth and development in our respective societies. These virtual arrangements, interaction by us as justice actors in the face of the current global health pandemic of COVID-19 affecting the free movement of goods and global and people globally cannot be overemphasized. We are therefore pleased to be a part of this process, part of this discussion, and we thank you for the endeavors in these very difficult and challenging times. Thank you very much, Minister Dean. Uh, we're going to come back to you with some questions as well in the next round. But first, I'm going to hand it over to Mr. Ferid Belhai from the World Bank uh, Group, the Vice President for Middle East and North Africa. Now, Mr. Belhai has been with the bank for many years. Before this position, he was Chief of Staff of the President of the World Bank Group. He's been Director for the Middle East, based in Beirut, and I'm sure has been following the developments there very closely over the past period. He's been the Director for the Pacific Department, leading the development of a regional strategy to scale up the bank's engagement in small and fragile states, and several other positions in the World Bank Group. So I'm just going to hand it straight over to you and uh, the screen is yours. Thank you very, very much. Uh, good evening or good afternoon. Very happy to see a number of uh, friendly faces. Uh, uh, Minister Kach, obviously. I'm very happy to be here on this panel with you, uh, um, Minister Dean and, and all of the colleagues around this big table. Uh, I believe that a lot of very important concepts were already put on the table. And uh, what I'd like to go is really into possibly opening avenues for, for this conversation. Uh, we all agree on the need for justice, and we all agree on the need for a justice system uh, or justice dynamics that would allow to prevent conflict or when the conflict is unfortunately there, to manage it and possibly be a way out of it. And I believe that this is something that all of us around this table not only uh, are committed to, but also have done things about it over their, their, their careers and their, and their lives. Um, crises, as Minister Kach mentioned, trigger tensions and conflict. We are in the middle of such crisis now around the world. It so happens that uh, in the Middle East and North Africa, we had a number of crises, one of which uh, has triggered tremendous ripple effects all through the world uh, in, in the 2010-2011 in the uh, framework. During that time, 
we saw a number of demonstrations, a number of young people coming and, and hitting the street, calling for justice and calling for, for dignity and for more opportunities. They were faced for years with systems that did not allow, you know, the justice as a tool for fairness. And I believe it is very important to stress that concept. Justice and fairness is absolutely a cornerstone. If you look at, again, going back to all the region I am responsible for at the World Bank, on a uh, time frame of about 20, 25 years, you know, by 2050, we'll be looking at close to 300 million young people knocking at the door of the job market in the Middle East and North Africa. This is a tremendous opportunity, huge energy. But for these young people are thirsty for justice, for democracy, and for opportunity. And this is where our conversation here could be helpful. I'd like to touch on four issues. One is uh, something that was tested very successfully in a number of countries, in particular when it comes to South Africa and to Morocco, both sides and both parts of this great continent. Transitional justice, yeah. truth commission. What happened with Desmond Tutu uh, years back and what happened in Morocco you know, uh, a few years later are very good example of how transitional justice is managed from and manage and avoiding, you know, revenge as part of the justice. And unfortunately, in some other cases, including in my in my own country, transitional justice turned into a revenge and actually became very politicized and did not go anywhere. So we have those examples that we need to tap into. Second point, when we look about when we look to democracy, openness, human rights, you know, we have a platform in every single one of our countries, even those who are for years under you know, difficult and tough dictatorships. The bar associations in all of our countries have always been a beacon for debate, openness, democracy. It's very important to keep building on those professionals that have in good times and bad times, always been at the forefront of the, of the, uh, of the rule of law, of democracy, of human rights, and advocating access to justice. And I believe this is something that should be looking at very, very carefully. Last point, and I believe that it was, it was mentioned, the whole conversation about the social contract. The social contract is an interesting concept. We need to dig deep into it and really to understand the meaning of it and how, how far we can go you know, in, in terms of making it more of a concrete proposition. When I look today at the social contract in a large number of our countries, it, it's basically moving from a social dynamic to an economic dynamic. And I believe that we need to push that agenda, make sure that you know, the young people who, are, who want to enter you know, the job market, who want to enter the, uh, you know, the entrepreneurship, have the capacity to do it because of their education and their, and their, and their free spirit, but also the means to do it because of a legal and regular, a regulatory framework that would allow them to enjoy contestability, to enjoy the predictability of a justice system, and to enjoy the fairness of a justice system that is not uh, basically a, a, a monopoly of rent-seeking interests all across the countries. So we, I believe that those, those issues should be put on the table. And I'll finish with one uh, last point. It is good to get inspiration from a number of legal and judicial systems around the world. But at the end of the day, nothing works better than a ju justice system, regulatory system that is really in tune with the realities on the ground. And I'll give you one quick example and I'll finish with this, going back to my own you know, economic background in a way. You know, we have this very uh, odd tendency of importing, you know, old concepts from, from countries that we see are the successful ones. Take the uh, investment codes, for instance. We have them flourishing all over the developing countries. But you know what? When you talk to actual entrepreneurs, they will tell you that we don't care about those codes because they mean nothing. And by the way, if you look at every single OECD country, not one has an actual investment code because they don't work. 
So this is an example of importing something from somewhere that doesn't work. So we need to really to create a new way of developing a justice system, economic, social, you know, uh, criminal, that is more in tune with the reality of the countries in which we are working. And thanks again for the invitation. Good to be with you. Thank you very, very much. I have been informed that uh, Minister Cog unfortunately has to leave us at some stage due to a force majeure situation. We are very lucky that Maria Churman, the director in the Department for Stabilization and Humanitarian Aid in the ministry, will jump in and be part of the Q&A session instead. So thank you, Minister Carr. Good luck with everything on your side and thank you for your support. And we wish welcome to, to Maria Churman. But before I hand it over to her, I'd like to go back to Minister Dean, actually, to hear a little bit more about the concrete problems and challenges you have on the ground now in, in Liberia um, in terms of COVID-19, but also the concrete justice challenges that people are confronting. Minister Thank Dean. You. Thank you. We confined our first case of COVID-19 in March 2020. As of August 19, we had 1,282 cases with 82 deaths and 803 recoveries. In response to the global pandemic, Liberia launched the National Preparedness and Response Plan in February 2020. And the plan is designed to achieve the following, limit human to human transmission, early identification, isolation and care for patients, address critical clinical unknowns, communication of critical risks and information to communities, minimize economic, social economic impact through multi-sectoral partnerships and facilitate post-recovery operations. The government also had to declare a state of emergency and close down schools and many social facilities. Employment is affected and the justice system itself is affected. The Supreme Court of Liberia, by an order, suspended trial by jury. And our system is largely based on the jury system, trial by jury. So this has seen overcrowded dockets, overcrowded prisons, and other human rights with other human rights implications. It has also affected, of course, the amount of cases that can be disposed of. We've also seen an increase in sexual gender-based violence cases, uh, especially rape. And uh, these are cases that are pending and quite a challenge for us. In the, prison, in the correctional facilities, We've had to make space for new prisoners uh, trying to observe the social distancing. And this, of course, has led to an exacerbation of the already overcrowded situation in the prison, limited access to health care, including maintaining a general hygienic environment. The economy has also been greatly affected, uh, a projected contraction of the country's GDP by 2.6% in 2020. We have uh, about 55% of our population 
living below poverty line. Uh, we are now told that the projection uh, by the end of 2020 will be about 68 percent. That means an additional 526,000 people are going to join those who were already living below the poverty line. Of course, other areas are like the rise in unemployment, impediment to international and local trade, the closure of the, the, closure of the borders. Um, notwithstanding, uh, some flags have resumed in Liberia since the, since the lifting of the restrictions and other protocol measures. Uh, the revenue generation has contracted a lot uh, based on the negative impact of COVID-19. The public and private sectors governance in the face of indefinite closedowns of public and private sector functions. We had a situation which nearly erupted into uh, disaster, a pandemonium, because we had to postpone the senatorial elections from October, the constitutional date, to December because of the COVID-19. Some of our law enforcement officers have been uh, affected. Myself, who is speaking, uh, I'm, uh, I'm a recoverer. I mm -hmm. recovered from uh, COVID-19 myself. Most of our police officers, uh, our Minister of uh, Information and others uh, were also victims. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Dean, and thank you for sharing your your uh, story and stories with us. And it's definitely a uh, sobering impression that we get from from your side um, for us to take forward. And and I'm going to hand it over now to Maria Schurman, a director in the Department for Stabilization and Humanitarian Aid in the Ministry in Netherlands. She has previously led a task force uh, on the UN Security Council membership for the Netherlands and had several other high-level positions, including special representative of women, peace and security in NATO. Um, now, Director Schurman, we've uh, heard Minister Dean explain what the situation is like on the ground in, in his country. Can, can you just tell us a little bit, we, we heard Minister Karg talk about the commitment to justice, which we are very grateful for. Uh, the Dutch commitment to justice. But can you tell us a little bit about your sense of the whole SDG agenda and the justice agenda? Are we now in a situation where COVID-19 is threatening all the meager progress that we've had? And how can we turn things around in order to, to basically raise the bar as the minister Yes, thank you for, I for the opportunity. The floor is yours, but the screen is yours. <laughs> thank you. Thanks a lot. And, and on behalf of the minister, and, and once again, regrets that she had to, to, to unexpectedly leave. But as she herself said, the, the SDG agenda is obviously set, helps us to set the benchmarks and to mitigate the impact um, of COVID and the legal disputes that it also um, uh, triggers. Mm. Um, so the way we see it, it is very much also in the light of building back better. Um, if COVID has demonstrated anything, has done anything, it is to demonstrate precisely the relevance and the urgency of the SDG agenda and particularly SDG 16 to deliver on a just, peaceful and inclusive society to address root causes of conflict 
including inequality and injustice, which is the most uh, fundamental. And COVID has obviously, as many people said, accelerated pre-existing inequalities. But it also has highlighted as, as a contrast fluid, the importance to address those if we want to not only fight the virus, but also um, work on the long-term impact, the secondary impact, which is much more gravely uh, the economic impact, but also the impact on justice. So, obviously, the in inevitable economic downturn will lead to job losses, uh, evictions, disputes within families, um, inheritance issues, and these are justice needs, um, not just economic needs. Mm. And so, as part of the Building Back Better agenda, we need this integrated approach um, a holistic way to address the justice needs and to deliver, deliver on what for us is, is most important, which is, as many people said before, the people-centered justice based on the lived experience of justice. And that requires us, I think, three things. First of all, to look at the justice system the way we see it, both in terms of funding, um, but also to orient funding um, away from coercive criminal justice systems to preventive people-centered approaches to delivering justice and to include all those partners. And I think um, um, previous speakers have highlighted that that are part of that justice system that deliver justice, not only the formal justice system, um, to work in partnership with them and that to be part that holistic and collaborative approach. People-centered justice should be part of the building back better if we really want to address these underlining um, inequalities um, and build on the resilience and the prevention. And the SDG agenda is ultimately a prevention and resilience agenda. Uh, and SDG 16 for us is the core of that. I think two other issues that the minister highlighted that are relevant there is indeed data and evidence as well mm. as innovation. Uh, and for data and evidence is first and foremost collecting data is for us to measure progress, but also to anticipate justice needs. For instance, the deaths that came from COVID-19, uh, unfortunately, but they will give a rise to many disputes on inheritance, on, on inheritance. And then online will writing can, for instance, provide a solution to avoid legal problems. But there may also be opportunities to tackle discrimination against women over inheritance in the current context. So we can also use this, this urgency to accelerate some of the efforts and innovations and data um, to prevent uh, an increase in justice needs and to address them, as the Minister said, in a more effective and low cost approach. Um, and I think in order, finally, the final remark would be in order to do that, we need indeed to, to increase our investments, we need to scale, um, scale, as the Minister said, successful approaches, but we need first and foremost partnerships. Uh, and that is what this platform is so important for. And we as the Netherlands are one of those who are very eager to continue to support and stimulate interactions between governments, justice leaders and professionals, the champions, as you said, live civil society, private sector, in order that we really get to those low cost effective approaches that will deliver on the promise of access to justice for all, and particularly for those who are left most behind. Thank you, Mariette. Now, you referred to the vision we have of building back better. Um, and I'm going to send that over to you, Mr. Belhai, uh, because while it's a widely shared vision. The goals, I think, uh, are shared by, by many. Uh, and there is now a space and an opening to think new in ter terms of creating more efficient ways forward and more, more transformative policies, maybe. But we also know that we aim for building back better in a world where we are short of resources or resources are under pressure. Institutions are definitely under pressure. We see polarization in many parts of the world. 
and we see millions of people in despair. So I guess that also then seeing that I'm a Norwegian and Norwegians are known to be blunt, does that mean that World Bank has to come in with increased funding to, to help the building back better? Um, and how does the World Bank integrate the justice needs and the holistic approach with, with very much a focus on justice that Maria talked about and the, the two ministers before? How is that integrated into the World Bank thinking? And how can the bank become more effective in order to deliver more and better on a strategy focusing on fragility, conflict and violence, which has justice integrated? I'm sorry, that was a lot of questions. But I'm sure you are going to deliver a very good set of answers. So the screen is yours. Thank you. No, thank you very much. Uh, actually, it's a very good and comprehensive question, and it is very much linked uh, to what uh, the previous speakers were, were, were putting on the table. Uh, first of all, well, in terms of, of financing, you know, rethinking, you know, uh, the justice systems, putting back fairness as part and parcel of how people perceive their justice system working is not costly in terms of financing. It is politically costly and it is politically costly for those who don't want to change. And this is where this kind of forum, this is where the World Bank and others come and need to push the agenda. So how do you push the agenda in a way that would make it so that those you know, in positions of, of power right now or in positions of dominance would actually understand that it is good for them as much as it is good for the larger number to move ahead on, on transparency, on governance, on predictability, on having a much fairer system. One of the ways we found, because we are an economic institution at the end of the day, mm. is to push the agenda about transparency, governance, and put it under the broader prism of investment economic growth. If you have a judicial system or legal system that provides for the economic actors, for investors, local and foreign investors, you know, to find a level playing field, to be able to put their money to work, make a good, you know, a good, good investment and make a good profit out of it, and at the same time, enlarge the possibility and the, uh, and the spectrum for growth and prosperity. This is the way we have been looking at it. Now, I can give you a number of examples of that. You know, you have a number of countries where we created commercial courts, where we created, you know, uh, 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 legal uh, training institutes, where we, where we train lawyers and judges to have them understand better the economics of justice. And you know, one would be surprised, the economic of justice have a very fundamental link to human rights, mm -hmm. very fundamental links to the capacity for the individual to be, to be able to fulfill him or herself. And it is very important that when young people, and I mentioned, I mentioned the tremendous number of young people who are coming you know, uh, to the job market in the Middle East and North Africa. And I'm not even talking to about, you know, the other part of Africa of which we are very much, you know, uh, integral uh, di di dimensional. We have a tremendous number of young people, energy that needs to be unleashed. You cannot unleash that energy if, people, if, if these young people don't feel that they have a fair shake at the opportunity. And that fair shake of the opportunity needs to be enshrined in laws and in regulation and in fairness. So when you create that dynamic, when you go to the, to the governments and to, and to the decision makers and explain what's in it for them, then you, know, you open doors. And that's what we have done all through the world. You know, I personally led the legal and judicial reform project in Morocco, 
in Tunisia years ago, in Egypt, in Jordan, but also in Thailand and in Cambodia, in places where you know people did not feel that their justice system was predictable, was transparent, and was actually conducive to more fairness. And I believe, again, and I will stop here, that that fairness dimension, you know, when you put it at the, at the economic level, when you have people with the dignity of getting into a place where they have a job, where they have the capacity to create jobs, to create businesses, that dignity is, in our view, in my view, you know, a, a, a dignity that is at the level of what one can consider a very fundamental human right. This is how, you know, the people in the, in the Middle East and North Africa rose to, uh, to revolutions in, the, in, in 2010 and 11. They want dignity and they wanted opportunity and they wanted justice. I would put all that under one big title, fairness. They want a fair shake at the, capacity, at the possibility for them to accomplish you know, their dreams and their potential. Again, it doesn't cost much. It doesn't cost much. It's not a question of money. It's a question of will. I think that is a, a very, very good point. Uh, we are going into the last few minutes of this Fragility Forum. Um, I think we, we all see that when inequality is growing, people have got no access to, to organize themselves and no access to justice. The risk of unrest and violence increases as well. So there's a broader agenda here. We, we have heard and we know that with increasing unemployment, despair is growing and with that also risks. So we need more justice. We need people-centered justice uh, and we need more investments in justice. And I totally agree that it does not have to cost much. Actually, the people-centered justice, the justice closer to people can actually be relatively cheap as well. Um, but we need to find those institutions. We need to set them up the mechanisms of dialogue, negotiations, and, and justice. So the big question is, how do we go forward building this movement in order to get more justice to, to the people? Um, and you only have a couple of minutes each to answer the big question, what next? What do we do next in order to build traction in this movement for a people-centered justice movement and campaign? Um, I'm going to hand it to you, Minister Dean, first. Two minutes as concluding you, remarks, if it's possible. Thank you. Definitely our ability to deliver on our sustainable development goals is challenged. And uh, justice is not, is not just now about mitigating conflicts and legal disputes, but about economic, health, housing, education, and other form of uh, human disasters. Uh, our national budgets must therefore take into consideration uh, the question of health security as a component of national security. We uh, will say that the, for the G7, as well as the South-South Dialogue perspective, we need to reinforce collaboration regionally as part of global strategy. And we think it should be also based on the specifics of each country's situation. Uh, yes, generally uh, there are similarities, but uh, specifics must be given credence because at the end of the day, you want ownership and sustainability uh, to come to play. We at the ministry are working on an ADR approach um, we are now doing a policy that will lead to 
the promulgation of laws that will make uh, ADR a part of our justice uh, component and part of our legal system. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to hand it over to Mariette Schudman for some uh, concluding remarks. What's next, Mariette? It is a very, very difficult question, I find. What's next? Because yeah. there's so much to do. Yeah. And how can we really, I've said, maybe it doesn't need a lot of money, but it is a huge task ahead of us and we can only do it right once <laughs> and mm. from the start. And I think for us, um, the first, and, and very much inspired by what Minister Dean just said, I think for us on, let's say, the side uh, on, uh, of the donor partner, maybe the, the first thing is really to listen. If we're serious about delivering on people-centered justice, we need the guts to do things in or unorthodox way. And we may indeed get answers when we really ask what the justice needs are that are very different from our perceptions of what people need. So particularly in this building back better mm. scenario, I think it starts with listening and being very open-minded and really to to focus on what is will be most transformative in re-establishing the resilience um, and mm. the dignity that the people themselves and those left furthest behind um, as they perceive it, rather than imposing our sort of systemic capacity building kind of approaches, uh, wanting to fix things different uh, quickly. So strategic patience and listening is on our side, I think, the big challenge for now. And daring to invert, to be, I mean, change our perspectives uh, to the current situation with a priority, I think, in really to rebuild as that resilience and trust in societies. And local empowerment. So, yes, the local voices. Yeah. Very good. Thank you very much. Good comments from both of you. And then I hand it over to, to Ferid Belhai for a last conclusion. Yes, comments. maybe a couple of points. What do we do next? Yes, a couple of points. One, one, we need to be realistic. This is not an instant coffee type of proposition. It takes time and breath to, put, to keep pushing. That's why I believe that we need to keep pushing this agenda. It's not a new agenda. You know, we are not reinventing something. It is something that's been going on. We need to keep pushing that agenda of transparency and justice. Second, uh, we need to lead by example. There is also something to be said about the fact that, you know, a, a number of countries that are seen as, you know, beacon of democracy, et cetera, may be sending a very odd example when it comes to transparency and to, you know, to the rule of law. So it's very important that what we advocate is actually done in the countries in which, or from which we are advocating. It's very, very important. And the last point is the issue that I will always push, education, education, education. There is a need, a very important need, to make sure that you know, legal education becomes part and parcel of our curricula in all of the countries in which we are working, because you cannot come at somebody who is 25 years old and start instilling you know, those concepts in his head or her head. It needs to start from the very beginning to make people understand that law, justice, fairness is part and parcel of the social contract that Sigrid Kapp was talking about earlier. And I believe that this is the way to go for the World Bank anyway. All of our projects that have to do with, 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 with the legal and judicial reform have a very important education and legal uh, uh, training component. It is fundamental to make sure that the bases are strong and solid and resilient. Thank you very much. Uh, we need to keep pushing. Uh, very good words, and it's going to take a lot of work. Uh, we are going to take those words with us as an appeal for building more traction in, in this and keep pushing. 
What's next on the Pathfinder's side? We are definitely going to keep pushing. The G7 Plus is definitely going to keep pushing. Uh, we have published on our side several reports on justice needs and gaps during the pand pandemic, and we're going to keep doing that. Uh, following up also on what Director Schurman and Minister Karg said about need for data and statistics and information in order to provide basis for policy action and the work that we, we need to do. So we will uh, take that appeal from the World Bank with us when we go out into the world after this session and also carry with us the words of uh, someone who had a very intimate knowledge of both law and not the least justice, namely Nelson Rolli Clarkla Mandela, who said that what counts in life is not the mere fact that we have lived, it is what difference we have made to the lives of others that will determine the sign of uh, the significance of the life we lead. And of course, he also reminded us that um, it always seems impossible until it is done. Um, with those words, on behalf of G7 Plus and Pathfinders, I'd like to thank the Bank, the Fragility Forum, the great speakers and champions that we have had online, and not the least, everyone sitting out there, picking up and following now this movement, building traction, doing the work, and we have to work hard and keep pushing in order to have success. Thank you very much, everyone.